The existence of Atlantis is one such mystery. For centuries, humans have been entertained by stories about lost cities and ancient civilizations. This has led to hundreds of expeditions and excavations in pursuit of unimaginable treasures. One such city is the lost city of Atlantis, storied to be one of the richest and most advanced civilizations in human history. But according to Joe Rogan, this city has just been found in the eye of the Sahara Desert. Are the stories about these cities real? What is the eye of the Sahara? And is it really Atlantis? Join us in this video as we discuss how Joe Rogan just announced a sudden discovery. Under the eye of the Sahara Desert. The Sahara Desert, which many people often just call the Sahara, is a vast, dry area of land that runs across North Africa. Covering a land area about the same size as the United States or China, it claims the title of the world's biggest hot desert. For many people, the Sahara looks like an inhospitable environment of dunes, plains of rocks and empty wastelands. But if you look more closely, you'll find a surprising variety of life that has adapted to the harsh circumstances. While the Sahara doesn't have many people living in it compared to other places, it is home to many plants, animals and about 2 million nomads who have learned to survive in the severe climate. One critical feature of the Sahara is its massive daily temperature changes. During the day, high temperatures often reach or go above 40 degrees Celsius. But at night, the desert gets very cold very quickly, with the temperature dropping below freezing point in some places. This sharp difference in temperature between day and night shows how extreme the climate is in the desert. Another famous feature of the Sahara might be its sand dunes. The constant force of the wind has cast these enormous areas of shifting sand into beautiful shapes and ridges that can reach great heights. Some of these dunes are about hundreds of kilometers long and look like they go on forever into the distance. Although it might be painted as such, the Sahara is not a lifeless desert. It is full of hardy plants like acacia trees, date palms and drought-resistant grasses that feed many different kinds of animals. Camels, which have gotten used to living in the brutal conditions of the desert, are also familiar sights. They help nomads and traders get around the Sahara's huge area. In addition to its beautiful landscapes, the Sahara has a lot of history and culture. People from ancient times, like the Egyptians, Berbers and Tuareg, left their mark on the desert. Today, you can still see archaeological sites, old trade routes and lively cultural customs. For a long time, the Sahara has been a place where different cultures and people from all over Africa and beyond have met and mixed. And set right in the middle of the Sahara is the feature that has gained notoriety as the site of the famed lost city of Atlantis. The ancient city of Atlantis is one of the most enduring legends and myths of all time. Since Plato wrote of it, there have been many trials to find out what this magical and elusive city is and where it is located. In such pursuits, it is expected that many geological sites would seek to lay claim to such a prestigious title. However, one site that has more going on for it as the most probable location for Atlantis is the Eye of the Sahara. Before we look at what the site is and looks like, let's seek out what we know about Atlantis. If you type the word Atlantis into Google, around 120 million results will pop up. That's a very clear sign that Plato's legend has captured the hearts of many people, from scientists to mysticists. The question many seek to answer is simple. Did Atlantis ever exist? Or was it just a mythical story? And if it existed, can its ruins be found? Historically, the only mention of Atlantis by name is in Plato's Dialogues, which was written around 360 BC. 
This literary work contains dozens of precise details about what Atlantis looked like and where it may have been located in relation to other landmarks in the ancient world. It was the level of detail that got many people into thinking that Atlantis actually existed. One of the best clues Plato gave about the city, which has been the driving light for many explorers over the years, is that there was a series of concentric circles around the city made from white, black and red stone. Also, he stated that the inhabitants were seafaring people. In Plato's words, Poseidon carved the mountain where his love dwelt into a palace and enclosed it with three circular moats of increasing width, varying from one to three stadia and separated by rings of land proportional in size. The Atlanteans then built bridges northward from the mountain, making a route to the rest of the island. They dug a great canal to the sea and, alongside the bridges, carved tunnels into the rings of rock so that ships could pass into the city around the mountain. They carved docks from the rock walls of the moats. Every passage to the city was guarded by gates and towers, and a wall surrounded each ring of the city. The walls were constructed of red, white and black rock quarried from the moats and were covered with brass, tin and the precious metal orichalcum, respectively. Among historians and philologists, there seems to be a consensus that Plato's story is fictional, but the tricky issue is determining what was the inspiration behind it. There has been evidence of Plato freely borrowing some of his allegories and metaphors from older traditions. This has led many scholars to assume that Atlantis was inspired by Egyptian records of the Thera eruption, the Sea People's invasion, or the Trojan War. Other scholars, however, insist that Plato created an entirely fictional account, drawing loose inspiration from events in his time, such as the failed Athenian invasion of Sicily in 415 to 413 BC, or the destruction of Halike in 373 BC. Some of the sites that have been proposed for Atlantis in the past have been around the Mediterranean Sea. These places include Sardinia, Crete, Santorini, Sicily, Cyprus and Malta. There also have been the Canary and Madeira Islands in the Atlantic Ocean. The most recent of these sites is the Eye of the Sahara in Africa. Brought to the limelight in 2018 in a viral YouTube video, the Eye of the Sahara, otherwise known as the Rechart Structure, perfectly matches Plato's description of Atlantis. The Rechat structure is a prominent circular geological feature in the Adra Plateau of the Sahara. It is located near Uadain in the Adra region of Mauritania. On the ground, it is about 25 miles across. According to researchers, the eye has certain features that make it the most qualified candidate for the Atlantis site. On the site, there are five concentric circles, a waterway outlet to the south, salty groundwater everywhere except below the center point, and mountains with waterfalls to the city's north. When it was first discovered in the 1930s, the Eye of the Sahara was originally thought to be an impact crater. But since then, research has shown that it could not have been created by extraterrestrial impact, but by terrestrial causes. After many theories have been postulated, most scientists have agreed on the theory that this formation is a 100 million years old dome of molten rock that has been eroded and shaped by wind and water. But for many people, this theory doesn't hold water, pun unintended. Many speculators believe that the reshut structure is not merely a geological wonder, unique in the whole world, but the location of the legendary 11,000-year-old city of Atlantis. As evidence for this, here are some interesting facts that show the correlations between Atlantis, as described by Plato, and the Eye of the Sahara. We'll let you be the judge. 1. According to Plato, Atlas, who was Poseidon's firstborn of ten brothers, was appointed king to rule over all ten provinces of Atlantis. He wrote, and to all of them he gave names, giving to him that was eldest and king the name after which the whole island was called and the sea spoke of as the Atlantic because the first king who then reigned had the name of Atlas. Incidentally, Atlas was also the name of the first king of Mauritania, West Africa, where the Eye of the Sahara is located. 
It also overlooks the Atlantic Ocean and has the Atlas Mountains to the north. And according to a map by Herodotus from 430 BC, that very region was called Atlantis. Coincidence or evidence? You decide. Two, according to Plato, there were alternate zones of sea and land larger and smaller, encircling one another. There were two of land and three of water. The part about the city was all a smooth plain, enclosing it roundabout and being itself encircled by mountains. Plato then goes on to explain the area in great detail, including all the measurements. Interestingly, when viewed from space, the massive eye of the Sahara also has two concentric bands of resistant quartzite rocks that form the ridges with lower level sedimentary rock between them. Also, the layout and measurements of the concentric circles and the gateway to Atlantis fit Plato's lengthy description perfectly, including massive flat plains to the south and an entire mountain ridge to the north. Three, Plato described Atlantis as an island that was larger than Libya and Asia at one point, saying, the whole region rose sheer out of the sea to a great height. While marine fossils and bones discovery in the region shows that the region was below sea level at various points in time, Plato describes how fresh waters ran from the mountains into a freshwater lake in the city of Atlantis and then ran towards the sea to the south, a channel that is still present. Also, Plato's comment about the island being larger than Libya and Asia could be interpreted to mean Northwest Africa's separation from the mainland by the ancient Tamanrasset River. This river ran from the Atlas Mountains through what is now the Sahara Desert to the sea at Mauritania about 7,000 years ago. With the sea level much lower around this period, it was entirely possible for the lake to have been fed entirely by fresh water, meaning it would be higher than the sea level. 4. According to Plato, there was fresh water available to the ancient city. He wrote two springs of water from beneath the earth, one of warm water and the other of cold, and making every variety of food to spring up abundantly from the soil. This claim has been verified by the discovery of a freshwater spring in the center of the eye of the Sahara. The hot water spring is likely due to the volcanic activity beneath the area. Also, the area still tends to hold fresh rainwater from streams running into it, growing vegetation in the middle of the desert to this day. The deeply weathered bedrock that formed the ridges was created under tropical environments, indicating the place was once lush, and many well-preserved freshwater fossils were found in the finer sandy deposits between them. 5. The historical presence of elephants in the region is another sign of the Eye of the Sahara as the most probable location. According to Plato, Atlantis contained a very large stock of elephants, for there was an ample food supply not only for all the other animals which haunt the marshes and lakes and rivers, or the mountains or the plains, but likewise also for this animal, which of its nature is the largest and most voracious. No other candidate for the site can lay claim to this detail, as the African elephant is known to have become extinct in Mauritania. 6. The local stones are a match for Plato's descriptions. In his work he wrote, and the stone they quarried beneath the central island all round, and from beneath the outer and inner circles, some of it being white, some black and some red. Some of their buildings were simple, but in others they put together different stones, varying the colour to please the eye and to be a natural source of delight. The city was fashioned by nature and by the labours of many generations of kings through long ages. This white, black and red stone is very obvious at the site and in the buildings of the nearby town of Uadan. The stones are small, not megaliths of any sort, and the buildings rudimentary, so it would not be surprising that a massive flood would wash them all away and leave no trace. A seventh important detail is that ancient artefacts were found at the site. And round about it, on this side and on that, were barracks for the greater part of the spearmen but the guardhouse of the more trusty of them was posted in the smaller circle, which was nearer the Acropolis, while those who were the most trustworthy of all had dwellings granted to them within the Acropolis round about the persons of the kings, Plato wrote.
over the years, an extraordinary collection of Acheulean artifacts, or stone spears and tools, of undetermined age and origin have been found at the Eye of the Sahara. That these artifacts were generally absent at the site's innermost depressions has been taken to indicate that the area was only used for short-term stone tool manufacturing and hunting. Also, this finding would fit with the description that the outer circle was largely inhabited by working citizens and soldiers, with Atlantean royalty in the middle. The eighth fact would be the identification of a sub-Saharan DNA from a previously unknown ancient population. Only recently, DNA testing of the Tafarolt skeletons identified clear markers linking their 15,000-year-old DNA to sub-Saharan Africa. These skeletons, over 30 Ibero-Marusian human remains from the Upper Paleolithic, were found in a cave cemetery in northern Ojda, Morocco. The DNA has some characteristics matching modern Hadza hunter-gatherers from East Africa and others matching modern West Africans. But the precise combination of characteristics from the DNA of the Tafarolt skeletons matches no previously identified population. This suggests that their DNA heritage may come from a population that no longer exists. The ninth fact is the evidence from carbon dating. Plato wrote, 9,000 is the sum of years since the war occurred, as is recorded, between the Atlantean dwellers beyond the Pillars of Heracles, the Strait of Gibraltar, and all that dwelt within them. The Ibero-Marusians, people of Atlantis, may have fought the Sibylians and Herifians, people of Egypt, around 9,000 BC. Plato dates the war to 9,000 years before Solon, which is around 11,000 years ago. To support this, numerous concordant radiocarbon dating indicates that the bulk of the sediments had accumulated at the Rishat structure between 15,000 and 18,000 BC. Interestingly, the meteor impact in Greenland that might well have spurred the earthquakes and floods may be as young as 12,000 years old. All this dating aligns with Plato's story. Then there's evidence of a flood. According to Plato, but afterward, there occurred violent earthquakes and flood, and in a single day and night of misfortune, all your warlike men in a body sank into the earth, and the island of Atlantis in like manner disappeared in the depths of the sea. The topography surrounding the Richat structure supports the notion that Africa had suffered a gigantic flood. In satellite images, it looks as if something literally swept over the entire area towards the sea. The gravelly deposits include slope scree, debris flow, and fluvia tile, or even torrential flow, supporting Plato's description that the area was flooded within a single day and a night. The eleventh fact would be the Eye of Osiris. Anyone who is familiar with Egyptian theology or mythology would immediately notice the similarities between the Eye of the Sahara and the symbol of the Eye of Osiris. Also known as the Eye of Horus, it is an ancient Egyptian symbol of protection, power and prosperity. Some even associate it with the shape of the pineal gland, which represents the third eye or awareness of the unseen. The Eye of Osiris is also represented on Maltese Luzu boats albeit in a different design to this day. However, the symbol may have originated in Atlantis because according to Plato. So all these, themselves and their descendants dwelt for many generations, bearing rule over many other islands throughout the sea, and holding sway besides, as was previously stated, over the Mediterranean peoples as far as Aegyptos, which is Egypt, and Tyrrhenia in Italy. While many are warming up to the possibility of the Eye of the Sahara being the location of Atlantis, many others refute it. The main argument against the Richa structure as a possible location for Atlantis is that it currently stands at 423 meters above sea level. Most importantly, there is absolutely no archaeological evidence of a city in the Rishat structure that existed 12,000 years ago, even though Plato wrote about a large, advanced settlement. There are no remains of a city's artifacts, of technology, or even a shard of clay pot, nothing. There is no evidence of engineering, of actual walls or man-built structures, 
or any improvements to the natural environment. Whether or not the reshut structure may really be Atlantis is subject to opinion, since no excavations have been made on the site. The argument for many is that you simply cannot have a civilization build an entire city and leave nothing behind. Thanks for watching another episode of Voyager. While you're still here, make sure to click the video on your screen for more mind-blowing videos about space.